So I thought we'd kind of start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, super excited to talk to you. Uh, what really got you interested in tech? Like, what was, where did you get your interest from? Yeah, um, so I, I got into tech from a pretty young age. Um, I come from a family of kind of like science and, and, and biology primarily, like in, my, um, in biotech. And so um, I'm really kind of like the, the black sheep of my family, like going off into this new field, or at least the first person in this new field. And what really attracted me was just really like the immediacy of a computer and its ability to, um, to be able to type something that you just like have in your brain and, and moments later it's translated into something real, right? Whereas like inside the lab, I remember as a child, like working in my dad's lab in, in the summers and how uh, we'd run these experiments and it would take like 10 days, like spinning, you know, um, a centrifuge or doing these like, science experiments. And that just really appealed to me. Um, and so um, I had this kind of early experience with a computer when um, I went to this um, garage sale with my mom and uh, I picked up this book. I remember buying it for a quarter of my own money um, for my allowance and basically um, had a, a whole book of computer games. And it started out at the beginning, I was just like entering in these computer games like manually, like and typing in the source code. Over time, I figured out like, hey, you can play around with these variables and um, change like what, what happens in the game by modifying it. And that's when I first started, you know, learning a little bit about how programs work. You know, and of course, much later in college, I, I learned how they actually work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> started out by uh, by trying to fix the system in a, in a in a video game, get a couple extra lives and stuff like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so one when I was doing a little bit of a deep dive on you, one of the things that I had to do a double take because I, I I wasn't I wasn't sure I heard it right, but you after high school joined Microsoft instead of going to college. So you were self-taught and ended up getting a job at, at Microsoft. How, how yeah. was that experience? Yeah, it was, um, it, it made a big, big impact on me. It was, it was kind of like my, uh, I was basically just like a teenager, right? Um, and going into my 20s. So it was definitely a, one of those foundational experiences for me. Um, I just um, kind of, hustled my way somehow into a job at Microsoft as one of the youngest people there. I was working on um, the Windows core uh, file system. Uh, it's called .NET, so it became part of Windows Vista. Um, and then I was on the early team for the Windows smartphone, which is like the Windows, uh, uh, they don't have this anymore today, but the Windows did have um, like a, a cell phone offering, you know, today's mainly an Android and iOS world. Um, so yeah, I remembered, um, going out there to Redmond from, from Atlanta, Georgia, you know, having my own place and just learning a, a ton from, I would say like the, the company that pioneered building, you know, professional software development about, about how to ship test and deploy software. So when you join Microsoft as one of the youngest people there, I'm sure you're encountering a lot of people that are seasoned vets in the engineering field. How did, how did they accept you? And what was that dynamic like with those types of engineers? Yeah, uh, I remember my manager PM was actually like a history major um, that, that somehow, you know, ended up being a PM there. Um, but then I, I sat, you know, right next to some really, really senior and advanced engineers. And, you know, frankly, I just, I just learned so much from them and, they were they were quite, they were quite ex accepting for me. I mean, I would say it's like a, it's a it, it, tech is like a pretty generally like welcoming place and meritocratic place, you know, versus, you know, maybe some other professions uh, to break into. Right? It's just really about like what you can you can contribute and bring to the team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we talked about this before, but you know, c being self taught and then jumping into a company like Microsoft is a is a giant leap, right? And people that have gone to college, people that have gone to boot camps, they don't even get to to work at a, a, an established tech company like Microsoft at times. You know what? What one drove you to to go to Microsoft, and then two, uh, what? How did you do it? <laughs> I mean, there's no other way to slice it. Like, how yeah. did you do? That? Um. So I think Microsoft in particular, just I. I just grew up hearing stories about Bill Gates, 
and how you started that company. So just always just admired that company. Um, and so did I just- Did you ever get to meet him? We, I did actually, because um, when I first started there, actually, it, it was really, I started as a, an intern and that transitioned into, a, after the summer was over, into like a, a full-time uh, job offer and staying on there for, for a year. So they back then um, in the Microsoft intern program, um, Bill Gates would invite all the interns um, to his house uh, at the end of the summer. So I got to go to Bill Gates' house and, and see uh, his backyard on the inside and, and to, to see him up close. So that was like, imagine as a young person, just like so inspiring, right? To see, yeah. um, to see that. That's crazy. That is insane. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, even like, I think even the full timers, I think don't get like invited to his house. Right. But it's like something that he used to do for, for all the interns. Wow. That, I mean, I can't even imagine what is back. I mean, that, I mean, it must look like a farm. Like, <laughs> yeah, this was like back in, um, you know, like this is quite a long t time ago. It's dating me a little bit, but it was like in the, the 2000s. But his, I remember his, in his house, like on the walls, he had like this really futuristic stuff like paintings that were like LCD panels that would move and shift like the artwork and stuff. And wow. at the time there was nothing like that out there, like in, yeah. in, in, in the real world. So it's like, he had some pretty yeah. advanced toys. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty nuts. So you go to Microsoft, you stay there for about a year, then you move on and you go to college studying computer science. Now, I mean, safe to say that, you probably came in more advanced than most people with that experience at Microsoft. So what did going to college really do for you uh, after that experience at Microsoft and being self-taught? I think that, I think the biggest, since I took like this kind of non-traditional path for most of my uh, peers, right. I think the biggest difference between me and others was just like this mindset of, Hey, I, I know now like a little bit like about the real world. And so my learning was a lot of really focused and uh, driven towards that. That's one of the main reasons why I wanted to get some more experience before jumping right into school is because I wanted some kind of like direction to my, to my learning, right? So just learning in general. Um, and so I think that really helped me understand, okay, I, I've been working for a company and so what are the gaps that I, that I don't have, right? That, uh, mm. what, what, are, what are the gaps in my knowledge? I'm not like a, by any means complete. I don't think people are ever fully complete in, in their education. Right. But um, some of those things were like some of the more theoretical aspects of computer science and, and math, right? So when you're self-taught, I think you're just trying to get your program to compile and get it to work and run. Uh, and, but college, I took as an opportunity because it's like, hey, here's like a kind of a dedicated block of time that I wanted to learn some of the more fundamental theories about how the computer works and what are the components and the hardware inside the computer to uh, how is, um, how do you build an operating system? How do you build a compiler, right? Um, and study like some math, right? It's hard to study math on, on the job, but learn things like linear algebra and differential equations. You really need like dedicated chunks of time to learn some of these these topics. Yeah, how, how did, um, because you speak about theory, uh, and that's one of the things, that's one of the, I, can't, I think one of the, I, I hate to say selling points, but it's one of those things that as a boot camp when you're speaking in contrast to like a, a, a traditional education, you start thinking about, well, college is more for, they, they speak more about theory. And then with boot camps, it's, it's much more like we get into the point we're making you job ready uh, on day one. How has learning the theory behind computer science uh, helped you in your career? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, um, that uh, depends on like what your your goal is and kind of like what time horizon you're trying to optimize for, right? Um, I think like something like a boot camp or the self-taught path is the best way to get from point A to point B. If point B is like getting getting in into a tech job, you know, like like as soon as you can, and you really only need like I would say like a minimal amount of theory, maybe the amount that you know I I could probably teach you in in an hour or two, to to really um, you know uh, help you in like that that first you know, year one to year four in your job, right? Um, just basic concepts about how the computer works. Uh, um, what's the, the, what are the parts of the, the operating system, the applications, the, the hardware, um, the network? Um, it's really uh, when you start to get 
to like the more advanced um, levels of, of programming where you're really trying to optimize and squeeze out a lot of performance out of the computer, right? So an analogy I like to use before is like it's between the difference between driving like a commuter car versus driving like an F1 car, right? Or working, mm -hmm. um, and it's the difference between driving the car and working on the engine, right? So right. Um, to, to just get a, a job as a software developer, you, you're just driving the car. You're using, you're just getting from point to point B to solve whatever business problem using code, right? Um, yeah. But if once you're starting to push the edge where, okay, it's about crunching, you know, like big data or you're trying to lower the latencies and really trying to, you're operating at the edge of that machine, right? That's where you need to understand at a low level, like how that machine works so that you can change things that maybe even at the operating system level or at, you know, at the, at the level of memory and registers and, and the SSD. Yeah. Um, so that, that's where um, you don't need that much theory to get started, but um, having that, that theoretical framework will maybe help you later on. And, and yeah, it yeah kind of based on where you're kind of based on where you're trying to go with your career. And I, I, I'm glad you pointed that out because I think that analogy is really strong because I think it's important for us, you know, just for the for the sake of people that, that are trying to change their career, for them to truly understand like what they're giving up by going to a boot camp versus college and yeah. how theory can be applied. Uh, it really, it really needs to be in the context of like what you actually want to do with your exactly. Career. Yeah, you don't need to be a mechanic to drive a car, right? And to to be a you know to, to get into that profession. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit now to you're now in grad, you go to grad school after college and you focus mostly on artificial intelligence. And I'm curious, why did you, why did you uh, choose artificial intelligence? Just like what caught your eye about AI? Yeah, I, I think it's just um, AI fascinated me from even like the beginnings, right? When I was hacking on computer games. And uh, it's like the part of the game that most fascinated me was that AI part. It's like when you're, you know, uh, you're uh, in a shooter and, and all of the other um, agents are, are bots, right? Or you're in a text-based adventure and it's like uh, the part that's like responding, you know, to, to your commands. Um, yeah. So uh, I think for me, uh, it's something I've just been like really obsessed with. And I think a lot of people get into AI because they, they want, this idea of this computer being more than just something that follows instructions, but something that mm -hmm. can like learn knowledge. And, and, you know, I always felt like I, as a human biological agent can't learn everything I want to learn. So, uh, <laughs> the best I can do is to build some system that could learn the world's knowledge. And then I can just use that system to, to help me do things. Did movies play a part in it at all? Because I think the only, the only, the first time I heard about, artificial intelligence was definitely through, it might've been like iRobot or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, did movies play a part at all? I think, I think, um, I think movies are a reflection of, of, um, of how society feels, right? Uh, I think, um, and so I think what, movies are just a manifestation of like, you know, like in movies like, you know, iRobot or, or what is another good one, the Johnny Depp one, Transcendence or Lucy, there's like some key point in the movie where like the bot connects to the internet <laughs> and then it's, it, <laughs> learn, it learns everything about human beings. And then after that, yeah. it, it, it then it can, it, it's reached another level of consciousness. Yeah. So what, what, what those movies leave out is, you know, if, if, uh, if a movie, if a bot was actually connected to the internet and it was using Comcast, it'd be quite slow. Actually, it'd take like <laughs> several minutes for every page to load. It wouldn't be like instantaneous <laughs> uh, at, at all. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of like what we're doing at Diffbot. We're actually building something that can read and understand the web and to try and distill it into what we call a knowledge graph such that um, the next gen of, of intelligent systems can be smarter, right? So um, imagine, you're, think about how you interact with Siri, you know, or, or, or Google Now. Um, they're not actually that smart, right? Like a lot of times the answer is like, sorry, I can't help you with that. Here, read this page, right? So we're trying to solve the problem of these, these agents actually do have some knowledge in them. They're not just machine learning algorithms. They actually have information uh, about common concepts, and then they're able to use that to translate to, to intelligence. Okay, so now here's the scary part about what you're saying is that 
in the movies, the robots always come, the, the artificial intelligence mm -hmm. always comes to the conclusion that humans are terrible and need to be eliminated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know what? To some degree, they might be right. But, yeah, yeah. Um, is that, you well, think that's possible? Well, so not from what I've seen. So uh, I think that's where I sort of <laughs> diverge a little bit from the movie uh, interpretation of AI as to, I haven't seen, you know, being an expert in AI and someone who's like active in the AI research community, what I, I don't see like actually any path of research that leads to an AI that has consciousness or emotions or its own intentions, right? Um, and so the way, the future of AI that, kind of like what we're trying to build at DiffBot is basically like a system that has knowledge and that can answer um, questions factually and can explain like why it believes those facts and then give you like the sources of that information, right? So I don't know how like this line of research leads to something that has emotions or that has like thoughts like that, that, you know, that we, we it's, um, and I don't think like there's like actually like a lot of, you know, um, effort in the AI community to like uh, actually explore that area, to be honest. Got you. <laughs> Got you. you. You said something interesting about fact. In a world of constant misinformation and then mistrust from public uh, on information, how do you see sort of DiffBot, and we'll come back to how you got into mm -hmm. DiffBot yeah. and stuff like that, but uh, how do you see DiffBot uh, working around things like that yeah uh so this this might get me into like a rant or, or maybe get get me oh, into like this whole, this whole other field but i mean i think we're living in a world today where our media is largely um funded by advertising and our search engines largely um don't take factuality into account at all or accuracy into account at all it sounds like crazy for me to say this, but like search engines don't actually care about whether the information is the most accurate or the best. They actually just care about um, relevance. And so your engagement with the information. So, right, because they, um, one view, kind of cynical view perhaps is that search engines just auction off your attention to the highest bidder and, and to, to what they click. And if you pay more, then you can get, you can get higher, right? Um, so, and Social media is kind of like that too. I mean, the feed mm -hmm. is not based on factuality at all. It's it's right. It's based on what's uh, the most can catch the most eyeballs, right? And, and that leads to this feedback loop. Um, so, as a counterbalance to that, we think people should be developing systems that actually can um, distill down like just really basic information about the entities of this world and and the facts among this world, right? So. Um, What's the location of this store? What what is the price of this product? What is uh, who you know? What is the status of the you know the various drugs? Um, these are things that are just factual statements, and you don't have an engine today where you can just type in a direct answer and just like see that data come back. Like here's the facts, here's the citations, right? Like Wikipedia is pretty good, but Wikipedia can't really answer your questions. Uh, Wikipedia is right. just like a collection of, of pages. Right. Right. And Wikipedia could be edited by pretty much anyone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, therein lies a, a big hole there. Uh, so I actually want to uh, take a pit stop on something that you did while you were in grad school learning AI. Because, I mean, you went to Stanford learning artificial intelligence. That, I mean, that's challenging enough. But you said... No, let's, 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 I can do a little bit more. Um, I'm going to go be a patent attorney uh, on, as a side hustle. Now, can you explain why you chose to be a patent attorney and, um, and how that actually went for you? Yeah. Well, so, um, you know, as you know, Stanford is a pretty entrepreneurial school, right? A lot of people go out and do startups from Stanford. Even the professors themselves are involved in a lot of startups and kind of on, on the board, boards of various startups. So um, my, my hustle basically back when I was um, a grad student at Stanford, uh, one, of, one of my hustle, side hustles was um, basically moonlighting as a patent attorney, like writing patents. And the story behind that is basically, you know, like a friend of mine um, used to work at a, one of these big law firms and he, he set out on his own with his own uh, patent um, IP practice over in San Jose. And it started out with just me helping him like uh, write patents, like the detailed description portion of the patent, which is basically 
a technical part of the patent that describes the invention, you know, has these figures and drawings. And then I, I eventually, you know, got good enough at doing that, that I could write the whole patent, even the part at the end, which is like the, the actual claims and the, and the legal uh, claims portion of the patent. Um, so, you know, I just thought, you know, why not just uh, self-study and take the patent bar? So that's what I did. I just uh, read, read the patent law end to end. It's about uh, about 2,000 pages, like this thing called the uh, the MPEP, um, and then went and sat for the patent bar. Um, and uh, the patent patent bar is basically a federal exam because uh, patents are are federal in nature, not not state in nature. And then and then passed. And then so that's how I became certified as a as a patent attorney. That is <laughs> that is wild. Uh, <laughs> I just thought that was a really interesting. I had to I had to I had to put that in somewhere. That was that's just <laughs> super interesting. Uh, so you, you're at Stanford studying AI. Uh, how did you get into starting Diffbot? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, like I said, I always had this kind of innate desire for AI, right? So I've been thinking about kind of the concepts behind Diffbot for quite a while. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting because, um, in, in the AI field, at least at that time, it was all about coming up with newer and better algorithms for artificial intelligence, right? It's, uh, think about AI research, it's like coming up with like a brand new um, neural network or transformer or something like that. Um, and I was kind of struggling with that in grad school, like coming up with like a brand new algorithm. But then I saw um, these folks down the hallway um, and what they did is they basically uh, were using Google image search and looking up pictures and then using Amazon Mechanical Turk to get people to label pictures. and um, this created a data set, basically, not a new algorithm, but a new set of data called ImageNet. And um, ImageNet is really what kicked off this latest hype of deep learning AI um, and really what caused um, uh, computer vision to go from something that was more like academic to something that's like actually better than human levels of accuracy and identifying, recognizing things oh, in wow. pictures, uh, recognizing like this is a dog, this is an apple, right? This is a cat in a picture is yeah. now quite good. And it was due to this data set. So I was thinking about, um, you know, what if we could, what if we want, our goal was to build um, an AI that could understand human language, what kind of data set would we need to build in order to do something like an image net? And uh, what I concluded is that um, you can't just like label every single concept that people talk about in natural language. There's just way too many concepts. Right, And so you actually have to build like an automated system in order to go out and start structuring knowledge. Um, and so that's when I started thinking in this direction of, hey, what, why don't we just try to build that system? Uh, why don't we just try to, there's so much information on the internet. The internet is kind of like a sum repository of human knowledge that someone has deemed worthy of creating a web page for. Uh, it's somewhere out there on the web. What, but it, the problem with the internet is just a set of pages, right? It's a, it's a, it's content, it's, it's fixed. Um, it's not a, in a database that you can actually query on and that you can mm -hmm. actually use it to, to train systems. Right. And right. so that's, that's kind of like my background thinking right into, and then, um, that that's kind of like what sparked my interest in like this idea of building like a knowledge graph for the whole web. And, uh, and many later, many years later, now we're, we're at the and we have the world's largest knowledge graph powered by a system that, um, crawls the web and we're competing with the big boys like Google and Bing. Like you are the only other U S company that does like a full web crawl. That's incredible. That, I mean, that's absolutely incredible. And congratulations on getting to 10 years. Cause I saw that this is your 10th year in, in uh, uh, doing Diffbot. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, this is the 10th year. We've, we've got our first um, angel investment in the company and seed funding, funding it in like 2012. Right. But, wow. but there's, there was a couple of years before that, that, uh, I work on it. It's pre-funding. Nice, nice. And and did the did the entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial vibe of Stanford really spark you? Um, feel, kind of feeling that confidence to just go out and and build a company, uh, especially of this magnitude. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just. Uh, I mean, I, I come from like an entrepreneurial family. My 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 dad is also quite entrepreneurial. So it was. Um, I feel I was quite quite blessed and quite lucky to come from that background where it, it was like okay to to do something like that, you know. And um, uh, hadn't saved up much, but you know, so it was the early days were pretty hard. I remember bootstrapping, eat, eating 
eating like rice and beans and stuff before funding, <laughs> eating ramen, a lot of ramen. But uh, but yeah, you don't need that much to get by. And so uh, it, it didn't feel like a big risk to me because I'm always someone who's like very impatient and always just trying to to hustle yeah. and just go charge forward, <laughs> you know, not thinking about the risk too much. <laughs> yeah. R- ramen, ramen is like the fuel to, to, to entrepreneurs and hustlers. It, it's what That's startups what are built from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most... <laughs> ramen and caffeine. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Definitely caffeine. Uh, I saw also that you've been a part of other startup companies that have been acquired. So how did those experiences help you now with, uh, with Diffbot? Because now you've done this for, for 10 years and, uh, you know, uh, at the time of this recording, yeah. haven't been acquired. So I'm curious, like, if you saw what was happening in those in those experiences of being acquired, and and are you intentional about sort of like building this to a certain point before you even entertain anything like that? Yeah. So there's two uh, startups that I was a part of. One of them was another side hustle I did in grad school uh, <laughs> that was called um, The Find. I joined as um, the, one of their founding engineers. So uh, after class at Stanford. Um, the professor for the course pulled me aside and said, Hey, Mike, I'm on the board of the startup. Why don't you join and be one of the founding engineers? So I'm like, okay, I did that. And many years later, they were acquired by, by Facebook. Um, that there was a, it's a company doing product search. So e-commerce search. Um, there was another startup. So this is just what happens when you're in Silicon Valley, you get pulled into like these various startups. Cause it's just like a, such a tight network. But another one was uh, called click.tv, which was um, a video search engine. Uh, again, search as a theme. And then I um, joined as their technical guy. Um, and then that was sold to Cisco. And so for for a couple of months, I was a Cisco employee, like going up to, to Cisco um, as part of this new division at Cisco. Um, and so both of those startups, I wasn't, first of all, the CEO. So I wasn't, I was the, the guy making it real, like the technical guy. Um, this is the first company where I'm the, the founder and CEO of the company. So that's really different. Another thing I realized from those companies and how they were acquired and ultimately being at the big company is, you know, I, I just re- realized I don't, that's not where I want to be. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to live and, and, and just be in, in the big company and at, at Cisco the rest of my life. Um, yeah. And so a lot of the people that joined Diffbot are kind of, you know, in a sense, big company refugees, right? They, they want to, <laughs> they want to move faster than what the big company yeah. allows. <laughs> um, yeah. So obviously at Diffbot, we've had many opportunities also. Um, just because of the space we're in um, to be acquired by lots of other big tech companies. But we want to go big. We want to go and build like an iconic, sustainable uh, thing that, that hopefully outlives us all uh, yeah. that can stand on its own. Nice. Your, your impatience would never allow <laughs> you to stay at a big company. Would <laughs> yeah. It? yeah. 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 Uh, you are a self-described machine learning engineer at heart, right? So I want to know how challenging is it to wear the hat of engineer and the hat of executive CEO? I think it depends on what company you work in, right? So uh, when your company is a machine learning company, right? And you're managing people that are machine learning engineers and stuff, then it's more possible. But uh, Mm -hmm. if, if, if you were doing something in a different field, then I I imagine there'd be a lot of, probably a lot of conflict (laughs) in doing that. Right. Um, But um, it, it's a it's a great question. I think there's, uh, you know, uh, at least some people have charged the path of that kind of engineering CEO kind of person, like Elon Musk, right? And like, and, and you know, in some sense, like Bill Gates was that, right? And, and the Google founders. So there's there are some role models of where like that works, where you have like that kind of very engineering CEO. But I guess we'll, I mean, I guess we'll see, <laughs> you know, whether yeah. that, 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 that's possible. Yeah. So. You found Diffbot and the essentially what Diffbot does, and correct me if I'm wrong and fill up any holes where I miss, but you're essentially a technology that can crawl the entire uh, internet for anything that you need and then essentially spit out a structured answer to to whatever the query is. Yeah. So, so Diffbot is basically, our mission is basically to build the first complete map of human knowledge, right? We want to build... Um, a system that contains public information that um, is in a structured format so that uh, applications and, and the next gen of, of, of smart systems, can, both business systems as well as play systems can use it, right? And it kind of democratizes the field of big data, allowing anyone to build on top of it as a platform, right? 
And the service that we offer is we call it knowledge as a service. So think of like just how like Amazon offers to compute as a service, right? Or other companies might offer as a storage. We offer the actual information, the knowledge as a service that your app can tap into. Um, so what our core technology is able to do is it's able to look at pages or documents, right? They don't have to be an HTML web page. It could be a PDF file, right? It could be just like some text. And it's then it's able to take that and distill it down. Okay, what are the entities, you know, the people, places, and things that this, this piece of information is talking about? And what are the relationships between those people, places, and things? And then automatically do that at a really large scale to build what's called the diffbot knowledge graph, um, which is like the most complete um, uh, kind of API that you can use to, to leverage, you know, uh, this, this, this large database of, of people, places, things, and these relationships. Um, so that's that's basically what Diffbot does, right? And we have over 420 companies, uh, both large and small, from indie app developers all the way to the largest companies in the world that, that use it mm -hmm. to power their experiences. That is incredibly impressive, to, especially to have done in this amount of time. Are you, uh, how, how large is the team? Uh, we're about, I think about 40, 45 people or so, so just like under 50. And that's, I mean, that's even more impressive because I mean, to, to do something that some of the largest companies in the world aren't capable of doing is, is pretty impressive. And I, I like the fact that you, you mentioned that you have companies that are small and, and companies that are enormous, um, in your, uh, as, as a client, my question is what's, what's the most interesting use case of this? Because I definitely, I even think about myself, if I was to use this on a, like as an individual and how helpful yeah. this would have been in college or something for like yeah. research papers. Well, the thing with like offering something as broad as knowledge as a service is you see all kinds of interesting things and creative ways that people come in and sign up and use the API all the time that you wouldn't expect, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. um, just like I'm sure Amazon does on EC2, there's all kinds of businesses, right, that are, that are using it, right? Um, so you have people uh, building consumer apps and experience and people building like enterprise business processes uh, kind of applications. Uh, I find both things fascinating. Uh, on the consumer side, you have people um, anywhere from building um, product pinning applications. And um, I don't know if people realize, but we power like parts of Snapchat and parts of uh, oh, wow. um, Instapaper. So when you read the articles in Instapaper, you're reading articles that are extracted from from pages from by default, um, as well as the stories feature inside, um, inside Snapchat. Um, the, the wedding uh, planning app, Zola, when you're like a new bride and you're like pasting in URLs for your wedding registry, it's default that extracts it and converts it into like a price and a picture and a brand that builds out your wedding registry. Or uh, some of these comparison shopping apps where there's like a browser extension, you click and it helps you find like a cheaper place to buy this, this shoe or the CV. It's using Diffbot's knowledge graph to find um, its understanding about where all the products are for this, this particular SKU right across the web. So you, it finds you like the cheaper price, right? Um, so um, some companies like Amazon and Walmart, their product experiences and search engines are powered by the, the kind of product data that we have in the knowledge graph you know, of uh, e-commerce, um, you, um, so even like some individual kind of hackerish projects, like someone was building a search engine for blind people, right? So they, they use the Diffbot's knowledge graph in order to build like a really high quality, like text to speech, uh, answering thing for someone that can't see. So in that sense, Diffbot is their eyes is actually being, it's a thing that treating wow. the pages and, and, and capturing the, the core text of the page and like what that page is about. Um, to, yeah, all kinds of random things. Like some, there's this one Japanese company that helps people buy um, Japanese products, um, and they were able to automate their entire operation that buys all those Japanese goods using um, using by like, querying Diffbot's knowledge graph to get like the latest price and in inventory and, and all these goods. Uh, it's a good drop shipping service. Uh, um, they sent me like this really really nice set of steak knives, made them like forged <laughs> out of like samurai steel or something. <laughs> Man, that is so dope. Is there is there a goal to make this, like, for lack of a better term, the like, a the Google of the web, like, essentially having this knowledge as a service on maybe even an individual level? Is that is that a goal? It, think it, think of it as like kind of like a structured version of Google, right? So, what is Google? Google was basically kind of like. Um, you type in a query and then it gives you a ranked set of things to read, 
That's what Google is, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of mm -hmm. like, uh, this is also dating me quite a bit, the card catalog of a library where uh, you go there, <laughs> you ask the librarian and they give you some recommendations, right? Here, it's like in this aisle, right, uh, to go read it. But what Google doesn't do is it doesn't actually read the books. And that's what Diffbot does. It actually is reading the books, distilling the knowledge, and it's doing the research. It's like saying, um, okay, what is the address of Diffbot? It says um, this, on this page, maybe that other page has this old address, maybe that page has this previous address. It's just combining multiple pages together and giving you the probability that this is like the current address, right? Uh, so it's like aggregating information from multiple pages to come up with actual facts, right? right. So we're, we're actually doing the reading and the research, which is um, in a sense, it's a much larger, harder problem than what, what Google's doing, which is just saying, here's uh, the top 10 results, here's the books to read and it will, 10 out of maybe a million possible results. And we're just uh, ranking them by um, relevance, meaning like what, what's you likely to want to read first or next. All right. Your, your story is astounding. I, I got to tell you, I, I'm always like, I'm always pretty curious and, and interested in the, the ambitions of a founder. And I'm curious, where did this ambition to continue to innovate comes from, come from? Because, I think when I, I guess maybe when I think a little bit existentially, like you start saying like, well, where does it end, right? Like when, when, when do you actually feel like, like there's a, like we've, we've hit the ceiling, but with founders and entrepreneurs, there is none there. There's just constant innovation. Is that, is that accurate? I think most founders are just kind of crazy people, right? In some sense, they're, <laughs> uh, it's a combination of craziness and, and stubbornness, right? And they, they don't have that kind of switch in their head that just holds them back. And that's like, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this. Or <laughs> maybe this is not uh, such a, a sound idea because if, probably if it was rational, then the big companies would already be doing it, right? Or some uh, some other thing would already be doing it. So I think most most founders have some wire loose in their brain in, in some way yeah. uh, where they're just like obsessed about something. And you kind of have to be to be working on something for such a sustained period of time, right? And And to be constantly thinking about something. Do you experience burnout? Do you get, do you, uh, do you feel like you, you kind of burn the candles at, at, at both sides sometimes? And what do you do to, to, to come back and, and kind of rejuvenate yourself? Um, I mean, I think as a founder, you, you encounter obstacles and challenges like all the time. Right. And, and, you know, I, I won't say like those can't be demotivating or, uh, uh, it's not, um, you know, uh, you know, it's like, it's like a, I think a good quote is like being an entrepreneur is like um, chewing glass and staring into the abyss. Um, <laughs> oh, <geez>. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> it's it's it, so the thing is, it's it, it sort of if you care about something enough, um, you don't really care that much about your emotional state because because your your mission and stuff drives you more than that. Um, so uh, burnout is an example of like just a temporary emotional state. It's like you. But if you if you really care about something more than that, then you find a way um, to power through that burnout because that's the journey of an entrepreneur. It's a roller coaster. It's that's just the next day something really awesome might happen, right? And then you no longer feel like that anymore. But it's just about right. getting you through those lulls. Right. You know that that reminds me of something that the late great Kobe Bryant said one time uh, when they asked him. Actually, I don't remember what they asked him, but essentially he said. Imagine if you're at home and you have a torn quad and uh, all of a sudden the, the, your house is on fire. He said, and you're, let's say your kids are upstairs. He's like, I'm willing to bet that you'd find a way upstairs to get your kids and run out of the house. For sure. He's yeah. like, that's, that's essentially what it's like when you mm -hmm. meet. Something greater birth. overrides that, right? Like, uh, and it's not that founders or you know, these great superstars, not that they don't feel pain. I think they do. I mean, it's not that they, they, they don't, you know, have uh, emotions and burnout and stuff. It's just that they, so, something else is more important to them than those things. Absolutely. I got a couple more questions. Uh, so people may not be aware of this and I wasn't aware of it until I went on Wikipedia since we were mentioning that. Uh, Artificial intelligence actually started back in the 1960s. People started talking about uh, artificial intelligence back in Dartmouth uh, 
college or yeah. university uh, back in the 1960s. And a researcher was even quoted as saying in the 1960s, machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. Now, <laughs> they might they might have been a little off on the time, yeah. <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. But with technology like like what we talk about with Google, with uh, DiffBot, even places uh, with uh, they use robotics like UiPath, a company I'm a big fan of. Uh, are these, are, are we only scratching the surface of what automation, machine learning, and AI can do? And if we are, what are some of the areas you can see AI kind of taking over in like maybe five to 10 years? Mm -hmm. I think we are. We're only, um, I think AI can only do like less than 1% of what a person can do. Um, and that, yeah, artificial intelligence started, um, that word, was coined by John McCarthy, who was actually part of the Stanford AI lab, you know, back in the, the 50s and 60s. And um, at the beginning, I think um, when the, uh, the field was first starting, people assumed like, we will solve this whole thing in 10 years, <laughs> we'll be done. Uh, yeah. uh, we'll we'll reach, have reached human level intelligence with our AIs. <laughs> but we'll, but what, what the whole history of the field shows us is like, as we knock down pillar by pillar by pillar, each domino falls. We have like a, a chess player that's better than any human chess player. We have a Go player that's better than any human Go yeah. player. We can yeah. classify spam better than any, any person can do. What we find is that those things are, are just like a fraction of what humans can do. Humans can do so many things and there's always the next thing that a human can do that, that the AI yeah. can't do. So um, I feel like that onion goes so deep for what uh, humans can do. and. Um, we were talking even earlier in this call, like emotionality, intention. Those are things that we're not even any more close to being able to do. Uh, maybe we shouldn't even do those things at all. <laughs> yeah. not even, we, 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 that's another question. Maybe, maybe that's not even worth doing, right? But uh, right. <laughs> I'm telling you, remember we were talking about the uh, the artificial intelligence movies and how when they get emotions, the only the first the first <laughs> order of business for artificial <laughs> intelligence is to. So wipe the human uh, yeah. human race away. That's yeah. the first order, right on the top of the list. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, so for anyone listening, uh, and for everyone listening, thank you for, for, uh, for making it this far into the video. We always appreciate that. Uh, for anyone listening that's interested in a career in data science, because, I mean, the, the, in the industry is moving so quick. There's, you know, uh, what was popular in 2021 will likely not be the most popular thing in 2022. Uh, what skill, what skill would you suggest that people entering the, maybe even the career space or just um, thinking about data science in general to, to pivot into that career? What do you, what skill would you suggest that they ensure that they're strong in, in order to be competitive in the market moving forward? Um. I think uh, the key skills of a data scientist to really stand out, right, um, amongst uh, you know all of your your peers and competitors is critical thinking and the ability to learn things quickly, right? Um, and you'd be you'd be surprised, like the, you know how few people can really think independently about a problem, right? Really to really like dive down into first principles, right? Like of the physics of the problem and like and really decompose and analyze problems. Right. All of these things that we learn are, are just tools in our tool belt. And those tools are kind of dispensable tools because, you know, any framework is just going to be replaced in the next year or two by another framework. Right. Um, there's kind of like a fashion to some of these tools. Right. But it's that ability that to quick to like reason and think independently and then to quickly be able to self learn, which is like the really rare thing to find in someone. Right. And uh, when you find that in someone that's like lightning in a bottle, you know, um, you, uh, we've hired people where, you know, their qualification and their resume doesn't look that great, but you can recognize that when you talk to them and in the interview and you know, you just want to work with that person. You just want to bring them onto the team tomorrow and they're going to figure it out. Mm. The ability to, to critically think, especially for where your company is right now, as you're growing, uh, you need people that can think pretty critically and independently in order to be able to pivot in a, in a fast moving a space just like yours. Yeah, as, imagine if you know if you're working in a data as a data scientist in a big company. It's not just about you know working on the problem that's given before if, that's put before you, right? But it's about thinking yeah. about it, that problem in the context of the whole business, 
right? And thinking about like, who do I need to talk to to really solve this problem, like all the way through, right? And that's such a rare thing to find in, in someone. And yeah. so it's it's that skill, I think, that you, you cultivate. It's, this is great advice from an uh, incredibly successful uh, entrepreneur in the, in the tech space, man. Mike, I appreciate you uh, taking the time. I know you're super busy, so I really appreciate it. Got one question that we ask always at the end, uh, and I'm super curious to hear your answer to this one, which is, what is a quote that you live by? Oh, man, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone um, has that reaction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Just do it, <laughs> I would say. Just, don't think, just drink. <laughs> that's what that's what that's what uh, my uh, roommate used to say. Who was like uh, a weightlifter. He was like drinking downing protein shakes, like just <laughs> uh, at night, like just do it. <laughs> Tugging those protein shakes with yeah. like egg yolks in it. Well, yeah, egg yolks, like a whole jar of peanut butter, like all <laughs> like all, all that stuff. Oh. In there. <laughs> Don't think, just drink. I haven't heard that one, but that is fantastic. <laughs> you put that up, put that on a t-shirt somewhere. That is fantastic. I'm sure that could be interpreted in a lot of different ways too. <laughs> yeah. <I> know. <laughs> you know what? You're right. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Um, Mike, uh, this was absolutely a pleasure, man. Uh, yeah. if, if people want to reach out to you, they want to connect with Diffbot, uh, where can they go? Um, if you want, if you're interested in what we do, just go to diffbot.com. There's actually like live demos where you could just like try our tech right there. You can put in a document or text. You can see it extract and build a knowledge graph. If you're interested in connecting with me, if there's some way I can help or be, or be value to you, just hook, hook me up on LinkedIn. Just like uh, add me or send me a message. Great. Fantastic. Mike, thanks again. And uh, thank you everyone for listening. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to comment. And uh, with that, we're out.